Okay, so let's start with uh, chapter number one and let's talk about switchable swimmers or especially switchable self-thermophoretic swimmers. So to state the idea again, we would like to uh, feedback control active particles, synthetic active particles. And for that purpose, um, we need each individual swimmer to be somehow switchable or controllable by any kind of external signal. Of course, we would like to do that on the basis of an individual swimmer. So we don't want to uh, control the whole ensemble uh, at the same time, but we would like to give each swimmer an identity. And that swimmer does then finally uh, what we want. Uh, this is the, the general goal. I have to state here at that point. So, so what could be uh, used as a signal and uh, the most important one or the easiest one is, of course, to use light. Uh, light is um, able to remotely induce a number of different processes. You can um, start catalytic, photocatalytic reactions with the help of light. But what you can also do is increase locally the temperature um, to cause phoretic effects or to cause a demixing a phase separation, which is used by other, others as well. So there are lots of different processes which can be induced by light and which can lead finally also to a propulsion of um, active particles. That's uh, what we want. So if you really want to have a very, very close look into these uh, phoretic processes, then you uh, probably are way better off with Evo's lecture, which is going to tell you um, about the different processes, quite a lot of things. Um, I just want to refer to the uh, self thermophoretic effect as this is um, a fundamental process which is helpful for us here in the following um, to understand. Okay, so uh, to do so, to explain what this self thermophoresis really means, <coughs> I have to uh, step back a, a tiny little bit and look at uh, thermosmosis first, and maybe even um, osmosis um, as a general phenomenon. So uh, you certainly know that osmotic pressure is generated if you place uh, where you split um, a reservoir into two parts, a left on the right side with a semi-permeable membrane where the liquid can pass, but the solutes here, uh, which are these tiny little dots, uh, cannot pass. And if the solutes are on the left side, for example, in a higher concentration than on the right side, uh, then the uh, diffusion of these solutes cannot equilibrate the concentration. So therefore the water has to do that and the water is pushing through the membrane uh, to equilibrate that. And if you have these nice communicating tubes uh, with the semi-permeable membrane in between, then you would see the liquid rising on the side where you have the higher concentration of the solutes. And this is osmotic uh, pressure, as you in general understand that, I, I think. So the same situation actually arises if you have heat dissolved in a liquid. Right? So heat would also uh, like to diffuse uh, from the hot side to the cold side against the temperature gradient, actually. So in the same way as here, the solutes, uh, here it's just heat. And if you could now generate a membrane which lets the heat not pass, but the liquid pass, um, then you would have a thermosmotic pressure here, which arises from the liquid flow from the right to the left. That's a great idea, <laughs> but it doesn't work because that semi-permeable membrane doesn't exist in this way. But you can turn that in, still into some liquid flow uh, by having a boundary between a liquid and a solid. And the special thing in the boundary is um, that in addition to the, or to the heat content, you have now here an interaction of that uh, liquid with a solid which is in a tiny little range. So let's say it's on the order of 10 or less nanometers, where the liquid by van der Waals interactions, um, electrostatic interactions, structural interactions, interacts with the solid, right? So this is happening on a very, very small scale. And it is important because by taking out a tiny little volume of the liquid here close to the interface and exchanging that uh, with a volume on the cold side, you can transport not only the heat which is uh, contained here in that volume, but you uh, also uh, exchange a bit of interaction energy which is different uh, with the solid in both of the regions. And that's the kind of thing which makes the semi-permeable membrane 
um, for heat here in principle possible, right? So that kind of additional excess enthalpy, which is exchanged by taking out the tiny little volume here on that side and go to that side. So you have a change in the excess enthalpy of interaction of the liquid with the solid um, due to that different heat content. And that creates finally this kind of flow where I always break my tongue um, if I try to explain that to you. Okay. So apparently this in excess enthalpy is playing uh, the important role and that means this kind of additional interaction of the liquid uh, with the solid as compared to the liquid-liquid interactions itself, right? So in a few cases, for example, for the electrostatic interactions, you can really calculate it explicitly and uh, you, you see what's going on because there are also possibly additional kind of ideal gas effects like here. Um, but uh, there are also additional hydrodynamics involved and that is resembled then by that boundary layer velocity which is called Vs here. And that Vs arises from an integral over that um, excess enthalpy as a function of uh, the distance here from the surface and that integral will go into a constant value after some distance which is this interaction length scale, right? In addition, you multiply that here by the temperature gradient uh, divided by the temperature. So that yields a velocity, a boundary velocity, which would be true if there's no hydrodynamic boundary condition here in the z direction anymore. So you, there's no additional surface present which pinpoints the boundary conditions for the liquid. Um, so this is called um, a quasi-slip velocity because that kind of uh, thickness here range that lambda is so small compared to other dimensions of the systems that you can collapse that um, into just a velocity jump where the liquid slides over the surface or slips over the surface and that's why it's called quasi-slip velocity. So since this expression is um, uh, pretty much complicated to write every time you can abbreviate that also by this one here which just says that the slip velocity is proportional to the temperature gradient, which is also here, and uh, a mobility coefficient mu, and that mobility coefficient expresses now uh, everything which is in that integral over the excess enthalpy. And whenever that mobility coefficient is apparently bigger than zero, uh, that means the liquid moves along the direction of the temperature gradient, so from cold to hot. If mu would be negative, it would move from hot to cold. And that solely depends on uh, the sign of the excess enthalpy. So if the excess enthalpy uh, of liquid-solid interaction is smaller than zero, then it would move to the hot. And if it's bigger than zero, it would move to the cold. Right? So um, this is uh, thermosmosis, and that is now the basis for our uh, thermophoretic motion of the colloidal particles. And this is uh, really important. So imagine again, if you have now that thermoosmotic flow which you generate at the solid liquid interface with a gradient here pointing in that direction, that means if you create a sample uh, where you have a solid uh, and the solid on the top and the liquid here in between and you have here hot and cold, uh, then at the substrate liquid boundaries you get that um, interfacial flow with a Vs here which is already collapsed here. Um, to the hot side and uh, you get that parabolic flow profile in that uh, slit pore here where you have a flow towards the heat source in the middle uh, at the edges and in the middle it's towards the cold. Uh, due to mass conservation it has to go this way. So if you would place uh, uh, a tracer particle here, uh, the tracer particle would see here close to the interface a motion of the liquid towards the hot and here a motion of the liquid uh, towards the cold. So in thermal osmosis, the liquid really moves. On the other side, uh, these colloids are also now objects which have a solid liquid interface and they may have a temperature gradient here along them as well. Uh, so the liquid will also move from the cold to the hot in uh, the most common cases. And since uh, due to that flow, actually, there will be a force balance uh, which is created and the colloid moves to the right side because the whole system has to be force-free here in that case. Yeah, so in that case, the colloid will move and not the liquid will move. So the liquid will, of course, here uh, create a flow, but it will 
allow the colloid to sneak through the liquid. Um, but the colloid will move from the hot to the cold because the thermal osmosis goes from the cold to the hot. So the drift velocity of that kind of colloid is then related also to the temperature gradient and a kind of mobility coefficient, which is called the thermodiffusion coefficient, but with a minus sign here in front of that because um, it moves from hot to the cold while the osmosis is going in the other direction. And that uh, thermodiffusion coefficient, um, which is strangely called th thermodiffusion coefficient, but um, it's called like that um, historically, is related for a spherical particle here to that a mu, which is in the thermal osmosis here on the surface uh, by a geometric factor, which is 230. In that case, for other uh, shaped particles, it might differ. But the dt is, of course, related to that mu here um, and that excess enthalpy. So thermophoresis is a result of thermosmosis, if you want to see it like that. And there are many more other processes um, in liquids which can be induced by temperatures, but that's um, the one we are looking at. So here you see again a representation of all of those. Here on the, t uh, on the left side you see a thermosmotic attraction of polystyrene particles to a heated gold particle in the middle, because that happens in a very, very thin liquid film. If you make the liquid film thicker, you have a thermophoretic repulsion of these polymer particles from the same gold particle. Um, uh, because of the flows on the surface of the colloid. Then in liquids, um, there are also thermoviscous effects are known. That's why you, uh, that appears when you dynamically change the viscosity due to heating, which is shown here for uh, gold nanoparticles, which are driven in the circle. And then you have all kinds of companion effects. One of them is depletion forces. Here are single DNA molecules, which are pulled towards a heat source. Uh, due to the presence of additional PEG molecules, so polyethylene glycol, um, which are thermophoretically repelled from the heat source, and that is causing an apparent attraction again. So uh, many, many other effects, companion effects, as I would call them, exist and can be used uh, for generating motion in, inside liquids with the help of temperature. Uh, gradients, but the ones we are going to use are the thermophoretic effects. And in particular, what we can now do, if you see that we always have a kind of heat source and a kind of thermophoretic, uh, uh, kind of thermophoretically active object, blah, 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 um, which we um, have in the system, so we need to generate the heat gradient somehow or the temperature gradient. So uh, if we can combine them into a single object, then you have a a self-thermophoretic object. And the simplest idea is to take a material which strongly interacts with um, light and uh, that are certainly um, uh, noble metals uh, which you pull into uh, small structures, tiny little structures, and they can sustain collective excitations of the conduction band electrons, so-called surface plasmons, and they have a strong resonance, um, for example, for gold here, around 520 nanometers if you take small particles. Um, uh, but uh, in general, the idea is the same. You take some kind of object which is efficiently turning the electromagnetic energy of uh, light into uh, heat on small scales and combine it uh, with a less thermally conductive uh, material inside the liquid. And then you can create self -thermo thermophoretic particles. And it's, uh, uh, difficult time for my tongue, but you see here one of the designs which you've seen probably already many, many times, metal cap on a polymer particle, either for chemical uh, um, driven particles or here for light driven particles when they call uh, create this kind of thermosmotic flow on the surface and they are therefore thermophoretically active at the end. Uh, at least the important part is that you can heat this kind of thing here, the gold cap, with the help of light. I, but you can also um, make a structure out of a, a molecular uh, part here, which is a six helix bundle of DNA, which is fused to a gold nanoparticle, and they combine, uh, give you also a, th a self-thermophoretic swimmer. It's only much harder to observe the self-thermophoretic motion of that kind of object. Or you can create a symmetric particle even, um, where you have tiny little gold particles here, in that case, uh, actually eight nanometer gold particles, which cover the surface 
of a polymer particle. You can use that also as a swimmer to generate heat here at any kind of place on the surface. Yeah? So um, that, that's the uh, way how the propulsion mechanism and principle works. And here you see a representation of the flow field, which is then uh, generated and the heat. So here, if you heat the gold cap, it will be almost isothermal. Uh, you have the constant temperature, but the gradients, the important gradients appear here at the uh, right at the interface to the polymer side. Uh, these are these thermoosmotic flows, which go to the hot here on, on all of these edges. And then it's propelled here with these kind of streamlines. I will show you the flow profiles as well. And if you take this kind of particle and place the gold nanoparticles on the surface, you also create <coughs> a temperature gradient here across the surface, um, which uh, keeps up these thermoosmotic flows and allows you the same kind of propulsion. So it doesn't matter if the object is symmetric or asymmetric. Um, there are some peculiarities, of course, uh, for the feedback control, um, but overall you just need an asymmetry in the temperature gradient, you know, uh, at least, or a temperature gradient at all. So here on the right side you see also the flow field, and <clears throat> again, the confirmation that the flow here has to be large on uh, those edges, and then the particle will propel in this kind of direction um, with a thermophoretic drift um, in that flow field. So for most of the cases, we are going to look at the temperatures you generate here on the uh, gold side are not too much higher than the temperature, um, the room temperature. So here you see an example where we heat the gold particles on the surface on average uh, uh, 3.5 Kelvin uh, above room temperature. So also here in most of the cases, uh, where we study generous particles later, the temperature rises will not be more than 10 Kelvin. So they could be rather, rather small. And uh, you can uh, propel particles with the help of this uh, effect in water or any other kind of liquid where they are stable in principle. Um, but you might have also additional effects at pair. So I would like to spare you all of the details now of the mean squared displacements and uh, how this propulsion changes with the amount of light you put in to the gold cap into heat because you've probably seen that already in other lectures. I just want to show you finally a tiny little movie where you see the motion of all of these particles here, these Janus type particles here now, one micrometer in diameter, how they propel inside that kind of region which is illuminated and it gets stuck here outside. So if you switch it off, <coughs> everything uh, stops and if you switch it on, everything propels and the more light you put in uh, the faster these particles propel typically uh, with velocities around 10 micrometers per second. Okay so that's for the switchable uh, self thermophoretic swimmers we are going to use and then the next step would be to have a look at uh, the feedback control mechanisms and the details of that.